Hello, I'm Billy Fitzgerald and I work for Continuum and I work for Colin. Continuum are, you know, I'm the head of design there and we're one of the Ireland's leading digital agencies. We've got companies like uh, Carfin Warehouse and Volkswagen Ireland and Tesco Mobile. That's us. I'm not shilling for Continuum though, as uh, Colin said. I'm here to talk to you about uh, experience design. Um, and we're all here today, we're all interested in the digital space and all that kind of stuff, but uh, we all presumably are aware of the phrase UX, user experience, that sort of stuff, but we are all probably hiding the fact that we don't know what the fuck that is. So um, experience, I'll just take you through it as, as quickly as I can, this whole thing. Um, experience is how it makes you feel. It's how a product or service makes you feel. It's a, it's a good definition of what it is. A lot of people think that's quite wishy-washy, you know, what's, what's, what's feeling got to do with anything? Well, feeling, the feeling that you connect with, you know, the, the, the connection that you make with somebody through an emotion or something like that will actually build into a loyalty, it'll build into a real lasting connection. And that in business is what we're looking for. We're looking for loyal customers, we're looking for connections with people. So if you've got a website that people only make an intellectual connection with, yes, there it is, that's got good sales or something like that, you're not going to really get anything out of that in terms of loyalties or customers. So to explain what experience really is, I use the analogy of going home to your parents' house for Christmas, so just cast your minds back. It's the, the experience of going home for Christmas is not about the visuals. Uh, it's not just about what the, you know, what the house looks like, how the decorations are, how the tree is looking in the corner. Yeah, that's part of it, but it's not just that. It's also not about the function. It's not just about like, how many rooms are in the house and you know, whether it's two floors or if the bathroom is working or if the cooker is properly, you know, properly working and all that kind of stuff. It's part of it. It's, it's part of the experience, but it's not the whole experience. This is what the experience is. It's about, you know, it's the sensual aspect of going home for Christmas and things like that. So you're, you're it's, the, it's the, the sound of the crackling fire in the grate and it's the smell of the, of the mulled wine going on in the tree in the corner. And it's the kind of conversation that you have around the table, the camaraderie. That is what the experience is. It's the sensual aspects. And they're the bits that you miss and they're the bits that you want to connect with when you think about going home for Christmas. Now, what does that have to do with a website? Well, one of our recent projects, Carfum Warehouse, uh, that's the visual design of it. Yeah, it's all fantastic. And I know you're all thinking, wow, this guy is amazing for designing something like that. But that's you know, only part of the experience. That's the visual element. Yeah, it's pretty. It does its job. That's great. And it's not the functional design. Uh, the functional design is a lot of stuff. Most people in here probably won't know what this is, but it's just a lot of services talking to each other in order to deliver phones and plans to people on the website. No, it's not. You know, that obviously has an impact onto the experience, but that is not the experience. The experience is this, and this is what we started with with our conversation with the car from Warehouse, was we want this to replicate our in-store experience. I go in there and a guy, an expert in this field, will give me impartial advice and will kind of hold my hand through the process but not patronize me, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the experience is created by every touch point you have with a product. So, it's, you know, it's hard to think of how you would create, you know, the family Christmas uh, table or the in-store experience. So what you have to do is you have to use building blocks, and that's every touch point you have with a product. Pro uh, with a product. If it's a website, if I'm clicking on something, every time I click, what happens when I click? That adds to my experience of the, of the site, okay? So consistency is obviously key, as we've talked about. So to talk about, like, you know, how the touch point evolves into your experience with a brand, I'll tell you why I think the Lewis hates me. So this is a short story about my, way, my relationship with the Lewis, which is a dysfunctional relationship at best. I live beside a Lewis stop, so I take the Lewis everywhere. I get the Lewis into work, I get the Lewis home from work, I get the Lewis to meet friends, to go to the pub, do all that kind of stuff. Um, but I can't help but, you know, through every touch point and through every experience I have with the Lewis, I can't help but think that the Lewis doesn't like me very much. Um, when I arrive at the Lewis, I've checked the app, I've checked all that stuff, I know roughly when the Lewis is arriving. When I arrive at the bottom of the steps there, the Lewis doesn't want to tell me if the, the tram's arriving. I know it knows if there's a tram arriving or, you know, if, the, if it's 10 minutes away, uh, but it doesn't want to tell me that. It hides itself from me. So I know on the other side of that little post there, there's a thing telling me there's a tram is due and I need to run up the stairs or not. And as I go up the stairs, I still can't see anything. It's still keeping its back to me. I got out into the platform. It's still got its back to me. It doesn't matter. In myself and everybody else, we can't tell when the Lewis is coming. If I'm coming from the other, other direction, uh, they've designed the shelters for the Lewis to be at the exact right height to obscure the real-time information as I come along. So again, like, I can't help but think that the Lewis just doesn't like me very much. And um, when I pay for my uh, Lewis ticket, I don't pay for it as I go. I get the, I have a leap ticket. It's my wonderful photograph that they said wouldn't be on the card when I took it. Um, they, you know, so I, I get this uh, automatically paid out of my pay packet because I thought that's wonderful. That means I don't have to do anything. I just get my card. It's automatically updated. I walk onto the Lewis, beep on, I'm done. No, I get 
an email every month saying, actually, you have to activate your card. You know, the money's on your card, great, but don't forget to activate. OK, activate. I go onto the platform, I beep it. Yeah, that's activating. No, actually, I have to go to a news agent to do that. So I have to go into the news agent and go up, queue up at the counter, yeah, go up to the guy and go, hi, uh, can you activate my Lewis card for me? And I had to learn that word activate because I kept forgetting. I was like, can you? Uh, beep my card, you know, like it's, it's a whole, so it's a little bit difficult, but that's not all. I actually have to pay 50 cent to activate it every single time. Now that's not much, that's only six euro a year, but as you can see, each of these little things adds up to a little, you know, a little, not a little stress and things like that, just a little uh, feeling that Lewis doesn't like me very much. Um, when I, uh, and Keith, you can press play there, when I forget to activate my card, this is me trying to use the machine. Um, so obviously, like I, this is me realistically trying to use the machine. Uh, I'm not uh, acting this or anything like that. But this is—it's difficult. It doesn't respond. So it's like I'm talking to somebody and they're going, "What? What? What did you say?" You know, it's—it's—it's it's, it's this interaction that I'm having with them is very much—it's uh, something where it's not responding to me. And it's compounded by the fact that in my pocket uh, I have one of the most advanced touchscreens in the world that I use hundreds of times a day. Anybody with a smartphone knows that touchscreen doesn't wait. There's no problem. If it does, there's something. You know, there's something really wrong. I know these are 12 years old, but it can't make me, you know, it, it makes me just feel like it doesn't like me very much. And of course, the usual gripe if I want to go to, from my house in South Dublin to uh, the Lighthouse Cinema or something like that, uh, note a 15 minute walk is required to transfer from the red to the green lines. So again, it just doesn't want me to get there. It t makes me feel like it doesn't like me very much. And this is the thing, how I feel about the Lewis is the sum of all of my experiences with it. It's not just, and I actually think the Lewis is a great thing, it's like, you know, I, I hop on a tram and it efficiently and, and cleanly and greenly gets me to where I want to go, it's punctual, it's great, it's much better than Dublin bus, it's brilliant. But the Lewis is not just that, it's every experience I have with it, every touch point I have. So when the card doesn't work, when the machine doesn't work, when it doesn't want to tell me the time, when the app crashes, that's that all adds up to my experience. And how a, just the highly scientific method of the biliogram here, this is, uh, it, I start at the start by walking onto the platform, I'm at neutral, so I'm just, I'm at zero, there's no feelings here or, at all. I see that I can't see the time, it gives me a little bit of angst, it just makes me a little bit pissed off, just brings me down to sad, we'll call it sad or frustrated. When I have to use the touch screen, that gets me angry, you know, that just brings me down another notch, so just using simple metrics like this. And when the Lewis, when I hop on the Lewis, and the Lewis arrives exactly when I want it to, and it works perfectly, and I hop on, it works great, that doesn't bring, you know, make up for all the problems I've had thus far. It just makes it a little bit better. It would have to, literally, they'd have to give me caviar on the, on the Lewis for me, to, bring, to make up for this stuff. So it doesn't bring me back up to neutral, it actually just brings me back up to sad. So my, ne my experience with the Lewis every day is a net negative experience. And that's an important thing. Your brand and everything like that, um, ha is, is connecting with people in, the, in this way. And if they have a net negative experience, why are they going to stay with you? The Lewis is literally two seconds walk from my house. So it's, you know, it's, it's much easier for me to take the Lewis. So there's, it's the only game in town. It's got a monopoly. I'll take it and I'll just deal with the, the annoyances, just like Ryanair or whatever. Um, but your customers obviously have you know, lots of competition. So if you're not doing, um, if you're not doing uh, something better than your competition, they could move there. And this is the thing, your customer doesn't care about your product. They only care what your product or service can do for them. They only care about th the ways that it can help their life. So our lives are filled with, our each day is filled with tiny micro tasks and micro stresses that add up to our entire experience. And we don't recharge during the day. We have a set number of basically uh, tasks and things like that. It's called decision fatigue. If we have to make too many decisions and too, many, and too much effort during the day, we find during the end of the day, we just don't, we've run out of the ability to make these decisions and the abilities to deal with these micro stresses. So if we think about something like Halo, Halo wasn't solving a problem that any of us thought we had. Booking a taxi, that's an easy thing to do, surely. It'll, you know, one, two, three, four. I have to find the number of a taxi service that is operating this part of town. Grand, I can Google that on my phone, it's wonderful, yeah, look it up, find that, it just takes 30 seconds. Right, call them. The other end of the phone, there's somebody, are they great at customer service? Are they a little bit difficult to deal with? It might be a little bit weird. If you're like me, you don't really like dealing with people on the phone in those kind of capacities because it's just a bit of an unknown quantity. So that's another little bit for me. Uh, I have to describe where I am. Unless I'm in my house and I have it practiced off, 
I have to communicate to the other person where they should pick me up. And there's a, you know, there's a usual back and forth. And then I have to wait maybe 20 minutes for a taxi, OK? So Halo came along and said, well, you know what? The amount of, the, uh, the amount of decisions and the amount of tasks that I have to do during the day can be reduced by four or five if we just make it into this easy thing. So Halo is just press a button. And that's all I have to do. To get here today, I pressed a button and uh, I put my phone in my pocket, and I, I paid through the app and everything like that. I never had to touch the button again. So that just took a few micro stresses out of my life and a few micro tasks out of my life. So I like Halo because it does that for me. Um, Virgin America last year, they, did, they looked at this from, now this is, this is the, not the most successful site in the world, but at least they're trying. Booking a flight, we all know what that's like. We rarely do it through our mobile. We'll probably sit down and go, Right, I've got to clear 20 minutes for my schedule because I'm booking a flight. So you sit down and you, and you get involved in it and you're, you're peering at the little things like, what country, hang on, don't insure me versus I'm not insured. What, you know, what, what are they asking here? So Virgin America decided to make it just a breezy kind of thing, asking you simple questions that you'd click on. So San Francisco is you know, where my IP address is, is locating me, so it's already chosen. It's already chosen as a round trip. These are the most popular destinations, so 90% of the people are probably going to be going to one of these places. I punch that. Who's flying? You know, me, that sort of thing. So it just takes that kind of peering at the thing and worrying about, is that what they meant by that question? And where is that information? And do I have a third line of my address? It takes all of that out of it. Um, Programming a thermostat at home, controlling my environment. Most of us will touch a thermostat maybe twice a year, and the re one of the reasons for that is because it's so unbelievably annoying to use it. It's like your videos used to be. You know, you, if, you, if you're anything like me, you probably have written down somewhere on your phone or on a piece of paper the three or 15 steps that you need to go through to change the thermostat. You know, the button on the left that doesn't have the label, click that three times. You know, uh, you know press the up button a few times to bring the temperature down. You know, it's all these kind of things that are unintuitive. Nest again not a perfect solution but it reimagined it it went what if you didn't have to go through those little stresses what if you could just click a button or turn a dial and uh, it would learn how you heat the house and all that kind of stuff and you can adjust it just at the click of a button or use an app it's just questioning how can i provide something because we're not talking about websites we're not talking about apps or products we're talking about solutions when somebody comes to me and they say right i need a website and there's lots of people that were saying it earlier i am doing a website at the moment or i need a website i always say to people, well, what are you trying to solve? And we'll figure out if you need a website or an app or a social media campaign or whatever it is. As one of the speakers said before, you need a solution, you need a product, that sort of thing. So it's the that's the best way to look at it. Um, and this is the thing, you have to start backwards. Uh, you start, <laughs> start backwards. Start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. Don't worry about the technology. There's enough experts in this room to help you with that sort of thing. Worry about what you want to give the customer and what you can do for them. Um, so how do we do all of that? Well, there's two basic tenets I'll get into. There's a lot more, but I'll just, I won't bore you too much this morning. Design for your audience is the key. This is not your audience. This is Stock Photo Man. And what is it Stock Photo Man is doing is he's sitting there in his uh, completely distractionless office. It's totally neutral. It's totally white and beige. Uh, he has a little pen and a piece of paper so he can write everything down, not going to get lost. He's moved the coffee to behind the computer because he's giving 100% of his attention to what's going on on that screen. Nobody has ever done this in the history of the world. Um, if you want to understand how a lion hunts, don't go to the zoo, go to the jungle. Okay? You rarely have your audience's full attention. You, don't, you just don't have them at all. You, this is familiar to everybody. This is actually how you surf the web. You do it when you should be talking to your good mate there. The two of you are actually probably liking each other's photographs on Instagram. Uh, life will distract you. When, you're on, when do you buy your cinema ticket? If you're, you know, you're going to buy it online, do you sit down with your laptop before you leave the place? Or do you use the non-responsive website or app on the bike, on the way, when you're already late for the movie. That's what most people do. So the website should take that into account. Uh, people have better things to do. Don't get in their way. Don't add stresses to their life. Uh, this is a great one. They may not even be sober. Look at your analytics. When are people using your site? Are they all using it at 1 a.m. on a Friday? Well, they might not be sober. This is a guy who'll test your website. You give him 500 quid, he'll get hammered and use your thing and prevent, present you with a usability test of how, what it is. If that's your, you know, think about Tinder. How many people do that sober? You know, like you, if, if you want it to work, it's got to be able to work with a swipe. That's better than a click, you know, just one, one thing. Um, and that leads us to test, retest, and test again. There's no idea that is so good that you can't 
test it to find out if it's better. And uh, it brings us to, like, this is all about removing uh, bias and removing assumption. Assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. This is from the great uh, philosophical work, Under Siege 2, Dark Territory. And it's very good to keep it in mind uh, because you have to remember that uh, you are you know, all of the design mistakes that we've made in our lives begin with, oh, I assume, okay, don't go any further, you're already making a mistake. Any, as I said, any idea that's worth its salt can, ex can stand to be tested because the worst thing that can happen is you'll find a way to improve that thing. So this is what we do. We set up a kind of a lab environment. It's fine. A load of cameras. We watch people use our things. We give them tasks. We watch people use our websites and our apps, and we see how they use it. We don't ask their opinion. It's usually not the, not the most useful thing. Just watch them use it. Somebody will tell you, I read everything on a website. Nobody has ever done that. Um, just because something's a good idea doesn't mean it'll work. When we began our car from warehouse project, everybody in the room, the client included, came up with this wonderful way of, of, of presenting uh, uh, phones and plans to people. And this was, wouldn't it be great if we asked you four or five questions and gave you a curated list of phones and plans that suit you? And I think we can all agree, that sounds fantastic. Wow, I'd love that. Sign me up, right? You're all thinking it's amazing, I can tell. Um, but it failed immediately in our tests. And why did it fail? Because it's the equivalent of you walking into Arnott's and somebody stopping you at the door and saying, before you go any further, what departments are you going to? What products do you want to look at? Sorry, you can't go further. You have to tell me before I'll let you look at the products. That's not how humans do it. Humans want to look at the full range and refine down to what they want. So it's just that thing. If you're you know, you, you, a good idea, which sounds great, if you don't test it, you might end up spending 100 grand on something that will never work for people. Um, just because everything, everyone says it's working doesn't mean it is. This is uh, it's, it, it, the classic thing in, in web design of we don't need the home button anymore. You might have seen, you might have noticed or you may not, that the home link has kind of disappeared from websites uh, over the last few years. So you see there before new cars and used cars, usually there'd be a home link. A standard web design theory says you don't need a home link because everyone knows you click the logo to get back to the home page. And I've been, uh, you know, spent in this for years as well. It's been absolutely true. I accidentally uh, set up a test for it with a semi-state agency two weeks ago, and 13 out of 14 users could not find their way back to the home page at any point on the site. It's just a thing. We, if we don't test it, we assume, and we use our bias of, yeah, yeah, that's how people use it, we will make that mistake and we will build something that cannot be used. Um, so to explain all of that and to wrap up, this is uh, Fairview Park, and this is the main avenue through Fairview Park. And at this end of the avenue is our office in East Wall, and at the other end of that avenue is my favorite place to get lunch in Fairview. And a few months ago, they put some water, they, they started doing some works on the water pipes underneath the park, which necessitated, you know, blocking off a, a, a building site and blocking that avenue and providing a little detour around it. The problem was that the guys who put the detour in didn't think of humans, and they didn't test, retest, or observe, or anything like that. So this is what happened. They put in, you see that rubber matting there, that horizontal line over there? You had to walk all the way up to the fence, turn 90 degrees to the left, walk along the rubber matting, then turn 90 degrees to the right, and walk that way. To the guy who said, you know, Jimmy, will you just kind of put out a rubber mat for people? That was perfect. Use probably the least amount of uh, rubber mats or whatever, you know, like perfect. That's all done. Done. So within a few days, I took this photograph of the fact that people were walking immediately off the path. Why are they doing that? Because human beings look at the goal they want to get to, the sandwich shop, please, now, and they, are, they walk there in the most straightforward, organic way they can get there. And, you know, that's obviously, that's, that just seems like, ah, that's not too important. But because they didn't observe it, within a few weeks and months, it turned into this muddy path. Now, it's a muddy path. Oh, God, the grass is gone. I'm sure it'll grow back. It's fine. But the fact is, on a rainy day, this is a death trap at this point. So you are go going along on this, and you're slipping, and you're falling, and all that sort of stuff. Still no response from the building site guys, and also no web designers went up to them and told them they were making a mistake. So I suppose I share equal blame. But because they didn't respond to this, because, uh, because they didn't uh, react to it or, or test it, it just got worse. And this is what started happening a few weeks later. Another path starts happening because it's not direct enough for people. This is, and this is what happens on the web. So just to sum up there, 
You have to create solutions, not products. You have to create solutions for people. You have to create experiences. If you don't create an experience, uh, believe me, an experience is already happening, and if you didn't create it, you're not in control of it. And if you're not in control of something with your brand on it, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Um, you've got to create connections with people, emotional connections with people, so that they'll, they'll remember you, and they'll think about you, and that'll make loyalty. They'll, people will come back to you, they will love you, uh, they'll come back to you, and they'll tell their friends about you, which is very important. So that's my high-level introduction to the world of experience design. So thank you very much.